I thought maybe we could start, if you want to take a moment to introduce yourself, it's probably helpful, uh, but uh, maybe in that same kind of conversation, um, whether, you know, thinking about kind of the media and news organization of the future uh, or the, you know, audit and consulting organization of the future, can you share a little bit about maybe what you're doing to embrace change within your organization, um, but of course start with your name, your role, your rank, your serial number, all those things. I can go. Uh, I'm, Pradeep, I'm Pradeep Pai. I'm the chief technology officer of a service group within KPMG advisory business called Spectrum. Um, so what we, our charter is to build and provide what we call managed solutions uh, to the market, which is really a euphemism for an always-on, um, repeatable, cloud-enabled business outcome that our, our clients consume on a subscription basis, right? So we are, if you think about it, we are <clears throat> the product side of a large you know, professional consulting uh, firm. Um, in my role as a CTO, I'm responsible for all of product engineering and uh, technical operations. So I get to support the stuff that you know, my teams build. Um, the key aspect of what we do, which is very different, and we'll go into that in more detail later on, is uh, we are, you know, in terms of the transformation and the mutation, we are moving away from being a pure play engagement based, you know, uh, business model to having an, a more annuitized business outcome based, you know, subscription uh, type of a, of a firm. And I think that's the transformation that... Can, can you give have. like a tangible example of how that plays out? Yeah, so a classic example would be, you know, we have a very uh, large, you know, uh, and deep expertise in forensics, right? So we help globally our clients, you know, manage risks uh, associated with their third parties or their alliances or, you know, their suppliers. Um, traditionally, we would provide that on an engagement basis, right? So our client would run into some third party risk. Billable uh, hours. Right, and it would be provided in a classic professional services manner. So billable hours, you know, time materials based. Um, what we have moved now is to essentially codify our expertise in forensics and doing due diligence and providing that as a, as a solution, as a service that, you know, the client consumes on a, on a subscription basis to the term of the contract, right? So we feel very strongly that the expectation of the market is not for, you know, a time-bound engagement and then we walk away. It's more from an, a business outcome perspective where we almost guarantee or assure them that their third party risks are managed. And so just, just to be clear, is that a, a function of automation? Is that a function of technology? Or is it just a different way to bill? It's all of them. Okay. Right? So the, our belief is that you know, by lending automation, you know, um, artificial intelligence, uh, we can reduce the cost and the, um, the sophistication, uh, you know, increase the sophistication of how we provide these solutions um, and how they're consumed uh, by, our, by our client base. Perfect, yeah. great. Raman? Hi, I'm uh, Raman Beheshti. I'm the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Dow Jones. And Dow Jones uh, is a media information and now more of a data company. So we have kind of three parts to Not our... a news company anymore? Are they... uh, yeah, okay, it's a news company. Sure, okay, sorry, okay. Yeah, you can use any word. Yeah, sorry, yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> But we've got uh, one of the biggest brands, probably the most recognizable brand is the Wall Street Journal, uh, which, we, which we publish. Uh, and we have other consumer brands uh, like Barron's and Market Watch. Uh, and then we have a B2B offering, which is uh, products like Factiva and a risk and compliance business. Uh, I would say that news and media uh, has been mutating or being forced to mutate. You talked about organic kind of mutation and then a couple of types. I think there's been a lot of external forces that have changed our industry probably in the last 10, 15 years and are, are continuing to, to kind of change it. And so uh, from a product and, and, and technology perspective, it, I guess in the last 10, 15 years, it's become more and more critical that we're nimble and able to kind of respond to either some of the threats that are, that are happening around us, be it uh, the, the move away from print advertising to, to kind of digital and where those dollars are going, or uh, on the kind of B2B side, some of the opportunities that come in terms of increasing compliance and what data solutions we have at, at our disposal. So um, kind of the, the CTO role is becoming more and more of uh, an agent for change, if that makes sense. I'm sure we'll go sure. into that in a bit more more detail. Well, no, and I think within that, it's also, there's a couple of interesting things. First of all, uh, you both are at um, 
I'll call it endangered species type organizations, right? Um, the consulting organization, not to say that either of your businesses will be going out of business, but at a market level and at a, a you know, kind of uh, industry level, both of them are at risk. Uh, I think also what's interesting is you're both in what I will call technology product roles. So as you've been with these companies, you both have a pretty you know, decent run at each company. Um, can you share a little bit about where this mutation came from as you reinvent the business, as you drive and become that change agent? Uh, and you know, I think within that same maybe framework, uh, was it an organic, was it inorganic? Was it you know, just an idea, somebody said, oh crap, we need to deal with this because print advertising is going away or because, oh hey, we're not you know, making as much money on billable or you know, is there another angle to it? Is it really desperation or is it more you know, so forward thinking? I mean, we think it was forward thinking. But, um, <laughs> so in our case, at least, you know, it was completely market driven, right? So from, if you think about, you know, the professional uh, consulting industry, right? Uh, we saw about four or five years ago, um, the threat of, you know, margin pressure, right? So, and it came from, I think, two fronts. First was, you know, clearly in terms of the, the value chain, right? Um, we found that, you know, or we thought that we would have increased pressure from a pricing perspective on the types of services we were providing purely from, you know, those getting commoditized. Yeah? Um, so there was a clear, you know, pricing pressure in the market. And then at the top of the value chain, um, small boutique, you know, very specialized, um, you know, consulting firms, right? And, you know, with, you know, spe specifically focused on analytics and technology, right? Was the other threat front, yeah? So this was very secular and nothing specific to you know, KPMG. Um, I think this is across the you know, professional consulting you know, industry. Um, so we could have addressed both of those threats you know, organically and said you know, we could hire a lot of you know, new talent right, and continue the business model, uh, which we also have been doing. Right? But what the firm decided was that you know, one way to answer those threats was to actually codify our expertise, our experience, our knowledge assets. Right? and have those be consumed by our clients right? on a subscription basis that is always on and always evolving. Right? So our clients don't need to come back to us every year right? to consume a new level of sophistication. Right? So when they subscribe to our solutions through the life of the contract, they are essentially consuming everything that's happening um, you know, within the industry, within the technology stack, right? and they always you know, get that. No, out of the box. You've had to do a lot of new product creation as a, yes. a function of that. Um, what about what I'll call product continuation or product sustaining? Um, mm -hmm. You know, what are the things that you've had to do at a mechanism level, at a cultural level, at an organizational level to make sure that right. you, the product you stood up is successful? Yeah. So um, I think the to me that I just distill that to you know something called commercial development, right? So uh, typically, you know, as a firm. Um, our news for developing technology was largely to help, you know, what we call, you know, enable engagements, right? Mm -hmm. The delivery of a project. Um, this was the first time in our company's history that we had to build and deliver and support and evolve commercially ready software, right? And commercially ready, ready solutions. So that was a fairly transformative cultural change. Uh, it was contained within our service group. So we've been, over the last four years, going through you know, that journey right, of how to build and maintain you know, uh, commercially ready uh, solutions, right, where the emphasis you know, clearly is on you know, um, the margin, the bottom line, the cogs, and everything that comes with you know, building and taking you know, commercially ready software and products to market. And, and Robin, I think maybe kind of same question for you. Um, at a product level especially, uh, I'm, well, the irony is not lost that I think you know, KPMG is moving into the subscription business while you guys are trying to figure out how to actually get back to the subscription business. Oh, uh, ooh, yeah. I was going to say, I, <laughs> I think we are in the subscription, but we, we talk about being in the membership business. I, okay. I think I would love to say that we saw the change coming and we saw Facebook and Google turning up and taking kind of all the advertising dollars that used to go into print, it's not true. Uh, it took the whole industry uh, by surprise. And I think for a long time, the, the news industry didn't quite know whether they were friends and people kind of chased uh, the clicks that you'd get via Facebook and, and, and Google, which was actually helping to power their machines. Sure. 
uh, in terms of uh, kind of advertising. Uh, and and we, were, we, were, we, were, we didn't see it coming, but I think our reaction has been slightly different in terms of how we've gone about embracing that change or that kind of uh, mutation. Um, we're quite vocal against it. Um, and that has worked to kind of varying degrees. I think the other thing that we focused on about four years ago was a membership business. So actually now our kind of uh, company, the, the balance of kind of trade, if you like, our, our revenues are more from our membership than they are from our um, advertising can, business. Can you maybe delineate a little bit between, you know, the two? So membership meaning Mem subscribers paying versus yeah. advertising being kind of, and then freely distribute or? Yeah, exactly. So a lot, so publishers had a choice, right? Do you go after the clicks and do you go after scale in the hopes of getting digital advertising uh, dollars? Uh, we put up a harder paywall uh, four years ago that, that kind of stopped people from accessing the journal content unless they were paying uh, money for it. That also means, uh, and I'm probably going to regret saying this, but the experience has to be value for that um, subscription. Sure. So that the the emphasis on the quality of the products uh, sure. was much higher as a as a as a result. Uh, so that's the direction that that we went in. I think to some extent it looks like it's been the the kind of right direction. But the whole emphasis of the company kind of changed because no longer were we an advertise a, a news business that sold advertising. We were now a news business that, that kind of sold online um, subscriptions, and that came with it a very different. Kind of mentality. Is there is there more coming? And and I don't want you to divulge anything particularly you know uh, discreet <laughs> or secret. But uh, is there more coming from a product perspective to really build that kind of you know I'll call it belonging sense for members? You know it feels like there's an opportunity, if you will, from a productization perspective beyond just delivering media content you know to your members. Uh, is there more of kind of this desire to create experience? You know to to bring people together. Is that an area you're going down the path exploring, thinking about, or yeah, I, I think it's something that we spend a lot of uh, a lot of time thinking about as a as a company. And I guess it's less technology based, although technology kind of runs through everything uh, that we do now. But we've got the something called the uh, WSJ Plus, which is an experience based gathering of people uh, to kind of get together, which is the concept of membership. It, it gives you kind of uh, non payable kind of experiences, experiences you can't pay for. And also, it, it's probably not that well known, uh, and this is not meant to compete against this because they're very separate audiences, but we have uh, about 250 events a year where we convene. All right, that's enough of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. Look, and, I, and you guys put on world class events, and I'm a, a subscriber or a member, as it were. Um, so uh, maybe to, to uh, shift gears uh, for just a moment. So change is hard. Uh, I think every organization really has a, a very tough uh, you know, path ahead. Um, we mentioned it earlier, you know, and obviously being a lot in the startup world, uh, the moment you start a company is the moment that that company is at risk of going bankrupt, mm -hmm. period. Uh, if you're a Fortune 500 company has been around for 100 years, you are always constantly battling that risk. And it's really about whether you're winning or losing the battle. And, in t and sometimes inside the company, uh, that culture that's been established is really difficult to move along with the change. Um, can you give an example of maybe practical lessons learned, mm -hmm. things that have come to mind, um, or even obstacles that have come about, you know, maybe from a cultural perspective or, or even maybe from a technology perspective, um, that have been uh, really preventing that change or helping you embrace that change? So in our case, our principal go-to-market channel is our partnership network. Yeah, so if you just take a look at um, advisory. So all the partners, obviously, who you know, cover a sector or, a, or specific companies or a, a, a special domain, right? They, you know, historically are used to their, the traditional you know, engagement services model, right? And when we incepted you know, Spectrum as a solutions you know, service group, um, to be very honest, you know, we had to spend a lot of time you know, convincing that you know, go-to-market channel, right, and the partnership of the value proposition, not to the market per se, but to themselves. Yeah. So, if I were a partner, you know, selling supply chain risk advice um, to my clients, right, and we built a supply chain risk management solution, right, we were not able to, you know, convince largely in, in the initial stages the value proposition of letting that partner take us to market, take well, us to that and, client. And how yeah. did you then? I mean, was it literally it's a, it's a lot boots of, on know, the ground? Or? Boots on the ground, lots of convincing, right? And then there were you know, structurally certain things that were done that I can't talk about, right? 
from an incentive perspective. Organizational right? Organizational structure, got it. Right? Um, that created the right motivation sure. for for the for the network. And to, was to, there was there like a tipping point moment where you know at that you know once you got enough hearts and minds, all yeah. of a sudden you know now it just kind of went on its own. There's always for every solution there is you know the point of critical mass that mm -hmm. you have to reach. You know, getting there is the hard part. Um, once you reach there, I think the inflection happens very you know fairly rapidly. Yeah. yeah. So it's all about winning. You know. The large deals, you know, when we go after. So we recently we signed with, you know, the largest ONG, uh, you know, uh, company, right? And so the credibility kind of starts feeding on itself, and it's literally, at least in my experience, you know, you have to prove yourself, you know, for every small solution. Small win that gets small the next wins, win that gets so the next one. The, yeah. Yeah. And everybody loves success, and you know, at least for a couple of our products. We've, we've kind of you know reached that tipping point. Yeah, and it builds where, the credibility, and right? Build the credibility, um, yeah. And I imagine for you, Raman, I mean, you came into uh, a rather interesting uh, climate, I would imagine, um, when you joined uh, the, the organization. Maybe if you can share a little bit of lessons learned and obstacles. And yeah, I mean, um, I, well, I think ours is, so to, to kind of give a slightly different slant, I think that, that happened four years ago. I think now we're at a point at least um, kind of looking forward where we've got to go again. So we made the change, we went to a membership business, but there's a lot of then kind of like, oh, well, we're done, right, great. Now we've established this revenue, we're a membership business, money's good, the technology's okay, good, well done. But it's forcing us, it's forcing the, the company to then think again, be bold again, try and do something different again, what's next on the kind of horizon, and we're in that, I feel that we're in that moment now where we're kind of like, well, what do we do more? What else can we kind of do? Uh, and that's actually really tough. Uh, and we had an interesting moment um, recently where we became one of the first, uh, well, the only national newspaper on Apple News Plus, um, which is the, the kind of paid for subscription with Apple. And it was just a really interesting to see that whole kind of journey over the, the months because people were kind of like well you know we've established ourselves as a membership business if we go with apple what does it mean etc and pushing our, ourselves to make a bold decision it might be wrong, right or might be wrong but that that's actually it encourages me in terms of the culture that's now there that we're not satisfied with where we are which i think was the problem kind of when the facebook's and google's kind of emerged and, and started taking some of that advertising dollars there was kind of a denial that things sure. were happening outside sure. if that makes sense mm -hmm. And I think we have time for maybe one quick question. So I'll, I'll ask maybe for a bold prediction. Uh, within your business, what is going to be the next biggest innovation, the next thing that will change your business, um, whether that's a technology innovation, it's you know, something more around product, whatever you kind of can share. Um, what do you think in the next 10 years will be that key big thing? 10 years, OK. We can do five uh, if that's easier. I mean, if you I want was, to talk about next year. 15. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. uh, no, I, I, look, I, I think for us, it's about how people co consume content. Uh, and I know it's a little bit of a kind of a, I guess, a cliche in some ways, and it's talked about a lot, but uh, the advent of 5G will radically change how people consume everything. But for us, even without kind of 5G, how does the Wall Street Journal stay relevant to the to the kind of differing uh, consumer co consumption habits around content. Uh, so at the moment, kind of, you know, prints kind of translated into the website, translated into the app, it's all kind of text-based. But actually, how else do we get kind of content to people in, in kind of relevant ways? So is that video, is that audio, is that uh, kind of VR or AR? We've been experimenting with a lot of those uh, uh, different things. So is it about the, the method of delivery, or is it about just the dynamic uh, generation of it? It's both, actually. Okay. So where, what format, and then also how do you make it cheap to, it. Pr to produce Perfect. in multiple formats? And similar question for you, Pradeep. So within so, your business, what's the next big innovation? I don't know about 10 years, but at least over the next five, um, one strategy that we are very excited about is something that we call the powered enterprise. Mm -hmm. And what it literally means is, you know, instead of providing these discrete solutions to our end clients, um, we are very focused now from a strategy perspective to connect the dots, to connect the enterprise. Um, so if you're selling you know, procurement or you're selling you know, supply chain management, you're selling you know, third party risk, we feel very strongly that at some point um, there is some amount of you know, um, homogenous you know, connections and you know, interlinks right, from a business process perspective that you know, starts forming right, within the organization. And one of the principal reasons why we feel that our clients struggle is because they have all of these disparate you know, solutions, whether they are homegrown or whether they are consumed from outside, 
and that don't speak with each other, and then they spend a lot of time trying to, you know, glue these things together, sure. right? So, so integration. We feel that integration and you know, building this powered, connected enterprise mm -hmm. is where, at least from our perspective, um, our solutions are going to evolve to. Perfect. Yeah. Pradeep Robin, thank you so much. Thank for you. Coming. Got it. Really appreciate it.